Uh, hello, everyone. Um, some, I know some of you guys, but not all of you. I'll, I'll start with just an introduction to me. Um, I'm James. Uh, you can get me on Twitter at Floppy down there. Like, more people know me that way than by my actual name. Um, and I'm a developer. I'm uh, recently made head of the labs program at the Open Data Institute, which is nice. Um, and so looking at technology and open data and all that kind of thing, which I think, with reference to the previous talk, if I work for the Dark Lord of Open Data, that might make me a deputy. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, so, not sure sure how I feel about that. Um, but so I'm a, I'm a developer, I've been a software engineer for years. Um, I'm also a parent and I'm an activist. So I'm very interested in using technology to make a better world. Uh, I help organise a, a meetup group uh, which meets around here every month uh, called Clean Web London, which is about um, people using the web for sustainability. So taking on those, uh, I, I like taking on those really small achievable goals like fixing climate change. Um, <laughs> and when you work on really big problems, you hit really, really big blockers. And you know, you work well on this stuff. And eventually you hit politics. Um, this is an actual painting of Michael Howard that hangs in Paul Carl's house. I can't believe somebody actually would have a painting of themselves made by this. Um, I, I hate politics, I hate, we all hate politics, it's, we spend so much time moaning about it on Twitter, and, but you realise at some point through the sort of activist journey that our political system and the people in it are a really big blocker to a lot of stuff. On the other hand, I love open source, and I love collaboration, I love sharing ideas, and I love GitHub, um, and I did this talk at the weekend and I had to explain what all that meant, I cut those slides out. Um, and if only there was some way that we could resolve one of those using the other one, it would make me really happy for one of them. Um, so a couple of years ago, middle of 2013, um, I got really frustrated and bored of just complaining about, you know, about things on Twitter. And I thought, you know what we should do? We've all got really good ideas. We should write an open source manifesto. And we should have it in a GitHub repository. And wouldn't that be a world better? Um, and then I refused to actually do it. I wrote a blog post about this, and I refused to do it because I had far too many other projects to do. Um, unfortunately, a friend of mine did start it, which meant that then that blog was gone, and that I started adding all of stuff um, because of a complete lack of self-control. So we started writing this manifesto in open source by using open source principles of sharing, collaboration, openness, and so on. Um, and we've built a system around this. We've got a way of, it, we, we, essentially we've got a website, it's got a <coughs> in the corner where you can go click edit, anybody can propose a change, absolutely anyone can go in, change the policy to say what they think it should say. Um, on Wikipedia. But instead of, uh, not like Wikipedia, it doesn't go on there straight away because that would be insane. Uh, instead we have some voting rules, um, and the, we're sort of again taking the open source model where existing contributors get to vote on what goes in. So you can imagine project maintainers in an open source software project deciding what they accept the direction of the project. So, but as soon as anybody's got a change in, then they get to vote. Um, so it's it's open but with a bit of a, a bit of a gate on just you know Christmas. Um, so we need a certain number of agreements. Uh, you can abstain if you want to force more people to agree. You can say, mm, I'm not sure we're at which point it needs more people to agree. And anyone can block. So the, the, the reason for this is not, it's not a sort of straight majority system, you know, 50-50 more yeses than noes, but because of the sort of long tail of participation, it makes more sense for people to be able to go, oh, no, that's not right, if they're somewhere down, uh, down the end. Um, but, and, and, but still keep things moving, so it's a slightly different model. Um, and of course this is all on GitHub, so we can see all the history of this Francis. <laughs> and who else is in the room? Nobody. Um, but you can see who's changed what at all times. You know, can you go over there to any of the other political party manifestos and see actually who wrote that thing in about the, you know, that thing that you don't like? What was the reasoning that got to that? Here you can go in, you can look at the history, you can see all the conversations, because all the conversations about what goes in happen in public as well. Um, so that's good. Uh, that is the long term, which I already talked about. And the one important thing is the voting system itself is actually up for change as well, just the same as everything else. Um, you make an edit in exactly the same way, um, and it has changed a few times. Um, it got really difficult to pass changes at one point, 
And um, so we changed the voting system, but of course we had to get enough votes on the old system to change it to the new one. So I ended up chasing people like Francis to, to agree to it. <laughs> um, and eventually we did. But everything's up for discussion, everything's open. Um, and after, so we started that mid-2013, after a few months, we ended up with this, which is the Open Politics Manifesto. This lives on GitHub. It's, uh, you've got a nice blue button in the corner to suggest a change. It's nice and easy, takes you to a reasonably friendly editor, not the, the standard GitHub editor, which it used to do. Um, and you can look at openpolitics.org if you can. Um, and it has a bunch of principles. Again, every single thing here is editable. Change the image if you feel like it. Um, and so we started with this. And we intentionally didn't want it to be a single issue thing. So there are lots of single issue parties out there. I don't think personally that single issue parties work in the current political climate we have. So we were looking at everything. We've got policy across all of these areas. You know, a year in, we've got 8,000 words of policy across all of these from about 25 or so different contributors. This is a year ago. And the key ideas that were coming through were things like openness, transparency, improving democracy, um, moving towards some form of deliberative or liquid democracy in the sort of further future, about building a system for the 21st century. So there's sort of four. Um, also being able to take on those big problems, to, to use evidence to look at those big problems and do what needs to be done, not to worry about tomorrow's David Hale headline, which is very easy to say when you're not the person that David Hale headline is talking about, but anyway. Um, it's enabled by technology, but I think we wanted to wire in this sort of strong social conscience and, and progressive ideals. So this isn't your, this is a better world for everyone. That's the idea. It's not this Silicon Valley tech libertarianism that wants to go and build its own private island using all its technology because it can, and it can opt out and pay for everything with its bitcoins and let the rest of the planet, well, I don't quite work out how they think they're not connected to the rest of the planet. So, what do you do with everyone? How do we make a te technological system like this work for everyone? That's really important. Um, and if anybody uh, wants something to read, I highly recommend this. It's a book for Future Perfect by a guy called Steve Johnson. Stephen Johnson. Um, and it talks about uh, this idea of peer progressive as a political movement. <laughs> it's got the over there. Um, and it's not just the old left wing, it's not the old right wing, it's some combination of those and going forward. And it's this to me describes, I think, where sort of networked democracy is perhaps going. Um, anyway, so we're about a year ago, uh, in about May 2014, and I got annoyed all over again because of the EU elections. Um, and it was just so depressing. I, everything was going the wrong way. I, I think we can do better than the choices that everybody was going for. I think, I think optimistically, the future's going to be amazing, right? And we have to embrace it, not be afraid of it, not go back to some imagined 1950s. So I did something a bit stupid, um, which is I decided to stand. Um, and I thought to myself, oh, we've got, I've got a manifesto. <laughs> what else do you need? Uh, and so I announced that I was going to stand. And I decided I was going to do this openly all the way. I was going to blog about it, write about it, try and prove that it's accessible to me, to anyone. Um, and so yeah, I announced that, I ended up in a paper, which was a bit weird. Had to take a photograph at about three minutes' notice. Um, and I announced as an independent initially, but I think that, again, you know, much of a single issue doesn't really work in the current political climate. I don't think independents work in the political climate. I would love it if they did, but I don't think they do. I think you need a party, and none of the parties were really representing that new way of looking at things that I felt myself. Um, and so, because you have to start from where you are, uh, we need to build a movement and we need something else. And this is what we built. This is something new, and I was very pleased to see a logo on the thing. Oh, yeah, that was really cool. <laughs> and this was a political party that we formed, it adopted the manifesto. The manifesto is still a technically independent project, though most of the people say. Um, and it has core values around being optimistic, being open, being democratic, rational, courageous, ethical, and internationalist. You know, we're a global society. Um, and the people should be free, should be equal, and to have <coughs> privacy. Those were the kinds of things that were important to us when forming this. Um, so we started that. It actually took us six months to get the party formed. That's uh, not a talk. Um, lots and lots of bureaucracy and lots of confusion. Um, anyway, 
So now we're campaigning right? seven months before the election, but that's going to go really, really fast. So, first things first, Miranda, what am I doing? Uh, I live in Horsham, uh, which is a town of Sussex. Anybody know where that is? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At the top, up there, above, above the blobby bit, that's Gatwick Airport, down the bottom is Brighton. Uh, we're in the middle. This is Francis Ward's constituency. That made me popular with the people at work who uh, he was involved in getting a lot of the money initially for the Open Data Institute. So, like, you are running against who? <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, in about January, it came out that he wasn't standing again. He was going to get made Lord. Yeah. He is now Lord Maud. <laughs> Somebody else did suggest that. I'm not entirely sure. That <laughs> <laughs> um, and we've got a new guy instead. Uh, but that was interesting. It meant the whole thing was a little bit more open. You know, it's been MP there for years and years. At least they're going to have to try this time. Um, it's incredibly safe for your seat, needless to say. Uh, it's in the southeast. Um, a slight spoiler at this point, I am not going to win. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought I was going to, right? That was never the plan. There are 77,000 voters here. I need about 3,000 to get my deposit back. I'm also pretty unsure that's going to happen. Um, so yeah, so we start doing stuff. I started recording a podcast. A friend of mine um, from school said, oh, this is really interesting. I want to interview you all the way through. So we started recording podcasts. You can go and listen there. We haven't done one for a few weeks, uh, but we should, do, we should be getting back onto it. And to explore the ideas in the manifesto, to get used to talking about them, and to get used to being questioned, because I don't have to hold my ideas up in public very often on the political front. So this was really good. Uh, it's on iTunes and things. You can find it. Um, we started publishing all our finance data openly. We worked out an open data uh, scheme with uh, a guy from Spend Network, uh, which is uh, one of the ODI startups. And uh, we put everything in CSVs again on GitHub, and nicely through, uh, through their uh, GitHub pager system. And it has its certified open data. So all of the party finances, everything we spend, everything we raise is all open data. No reason why any of the other parties can't do that. Uh, they're just obviously too lazy to pockets. Or haven't noticed. <laughs> so, one of the things that I wanted to do was start going to talk to people, right? I wanted to get out, I wanted to say, right, we're going to take politics back to the people, we're going to go out, we're going to run town hall meetings, it's going to be great, we're going to book rooms, people are going to come along, we're going to talk to them, it's going to be amazing. We're going to have one town hall meeting in every ward, did a little bit of data analysis through the ONS to work out which orders to do them in, uh, because I'm an enormous data nerd. Um, we could just pick randomly, it wouldn't really matter to <laughs> But, you know, it has to need me. Uh, and this is what you want, right? This is, this is totally what you want. You, you want this to happen, you want to turn up loads of people. This is what happens. <laughs> um, getting the message out about this stuff is so hard. I live online, right? I'm going into the election thinking, I can internet better than all the others, it's going to be great. No, it's really, really hard. Trying to spread the word on Facebook is impossible unless you have a huge amount of money, and that's where everyone is. You know, the conservatives spend a massive amount on Facebook, and they have to. You can't, the organic reach is dead. So, yeah, really, really, really difficult. And I eventually, you know, ended up just doing the pubs, so at least when I was sat there on my own, I could have a drink. Um, <laughs> people could come on, we, we often, you know, three quarters of the time I have some people there who would come on, and we had fantastic conversations. It was really, really good. But, yeah, sometimes it was a bit depressing. And, you know, you have to come home to your wife and say, oh, yeah, I have five people there tonight. <laughs> just because so it didn't seem like a total waste of time. Um, you start getting emails, you start getting campaign emails and pledges, so many pledges, people want you to pledge everything. And questions, people would send you, some of them were really great, 38 degree stuff was, was fine, that was alright, you could respond to loads of those really quite quickly. But the emails with like 20 questions in where each of them demands a paragraph response was so hard to work with because it took, you know, an hour. Um, Democracy Club here were absolutely amazing. This was the best candidate experience by far. To have somebody collect together all the questions all the campaign groups wanted to ask. It was over prototypes, there were like five campaign groups or something like that. And they asked, you know, they've got all the questions and you could just answer them all in one go. It was fantastic. It was so good. Um, yeah. Well, my great to do that. But... I'm, <laughs> I was pretty much the first person to do all of your applications. <laughs> It's very fun to go, oh, Democracy Club released a new thing. Oh, look, I love that. Nice yeah. <laughs> Sim said in the last talk I did that, uh, you know, that every now and again they noticed, oh, something's made a change, and one of our things I was just changing again. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, going through the beginning of this year, it's just grind day after day after day, emails backing up all the time, 
everything else in life had dropped. No time to stop. I mean, I, there were months where I just literally didn't do anything else. The problem is everything happens in the day, so there's a massive denial of service attack on your job. How I still have a job is beyond me. <laughs> and I was doing this mostly a lot, and we had some volunteers, but organising them was another time sink. Getting people to understand what they need to do is really, really hard. And it's very hard to bootstrap. Um, Rick Farfinger wrote a, a book called Swarmwise that somebody very nicely sent me a copy of halfway through the campaign. And it's like, yeah, you can get all your people to go, and all your volunteers to go and do all these amazing things. You just empower them to do things by themselves. It'd be great to let them communicate and work it all out. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I love voting this. This is totally going to work. It works really well, Rick, if you have 100,000 people signed up on your mailing list in the first day. If you don't, it's less easy. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> that was difficult. So we're getting closer, March now. Come to Hustings. Um, who fancies the idea of sitting up on a podium with seven other political candidates asking questions, answering questions from the audience? Who wants to be a question time? <laughs> yeah, also. Um, there were three Hustings in the area, run by uh, CPRE, the local evangelical church and humanists. <coughs> they were actually all really, really good fun. I massively enjoyed it. Mainly because I actually thought all the other ones, I was really surprised because I thought all the other ones would be better at it. I thought they'd all be much better at putting across their messages. Um, and it was really surprising um, that most of them weren't. And it was lovely going into that, not worrying about how many votes I was going to get, not being afraid to piss people off. You know, not afraid of looking stupid, just happy to put my idea out there and say, this is what I think. Because I know I'm not going to win. I don't have to walk that narrow line of making everybody happy. Um, and actually, that seemed to make a lot of people happy, actually. Um, it was quite fun to stand up in front of the Evangelical Church and talk about freedom of speech, particularly in a case that they were interested in around uh, Christian who uh, talking, you know, been quoting homophobic passages from the Bible. Um, and uh, that was quite fun. We went across well, surprisingly. Um, so we did local debates, they were really good. We did national ones too. Did you notice me in the ITV leaders debate? No, not so much. We did on YouTube, that's why. Um, <laughs> uh, but, well, you remember the faff over who would get to be in the debates? Who gives a shit? We've got YouTube. I've recorded, recorded the thing, recorded my own responses, cut, cut myself into the, into the video, complete the targets and everything. Great. <laughs> um, uh, that was really good. And I had it on YouTube before midnight on the line. Um, 13 minutes of my own answers to big questions that were being put to all the leaders. And the really nice thing about that is I didn't have to watch any of the rest of it, I just cut the rest of the politicians out. <laughs> so I don't know what I said, and actually I don't care. That was a really nice thing about campaigning generally, is that you all had to listen to all the crap that they were talking about. I could just talk about what I wanted to talk about, and not really listen. It wasn't quite the same studio, though. Uh, the ITV one was a bit more flashy. Um, so we crowdfunded all this, we raised £1,620, through lots, through 38 lovely donors, um, which was enough to cover the leafleting costs and the deposit. You get a free leaflet delivery from the Royal Mail, so it was just printing costs, and that just about covered it, which was fantastic. That was really important stuff. Um, so thank you to all the wonderful crowdfunders. Um, if you hear maybe. Um, so now we're at the end of March, right? This is the short campaign now. Parliament's recessed, nominations are open. The party registration that I talked about earlier was completed just three weeks before the nomination deadline. That is how close. We was, we, at one point we thought we weren't going to make it. It wasn't going to happen. I was going to have to be an independent and stand on my own name, and my own name is massively generic. So, <laughs> it wasn't really great. Um, anyway, you go around, you knock on your friend's doors for nominees. You only need 10. Pretty easy. I know 10 people. I know 10 people who will sign a bit of paper for me. Uh, so yeah, that was, that was quite good. Um, and then we're getting really close. We get to the point where you have to start making leaflets. And it starts with a you know, scrawled bit of paper with a terrible picture of what looks like Daddy Pig on it. Um, and then, I think that big fans there, one of the parents. Um, and then slowly with all three, we add that uh, there's a sort of deadline you have to get the leaflet through the Royal Mail to approve before it gets sent out. Uh, before that's sent out. So you have to approve it before it gets printed and then to them. And I was about six hours away from my last deadline as to when it had to go to the Royal Mail, and I had the second one. And an amazing friend of mine, Fee, uh, who's not here, but I'm sure many of you know, uh, whipped out a design for it in three hours on a Sunday night, just through me going on Twitter, oh my god, please suddenly help me. And she did, and so that was amazing. 
And two days later, proof of from the wrong map, off it goes to the printers. We're standing in two constituencies. Actually, there's, we're standing in Porsche and Moran, and my brother in law standing in South West Surrey against Jeremy Hunter. Another nice achievable seat. <laughs> um, and a week later, we've got two pallets of leaflets. Right? Those ones are mine, those ones are his. It's 100,000 leaflets there, 50,000 for each. Why, why do I have these? What's going on? It's really weird. You deliver a whole load of them to the wrong mail, you have to package them up. The operation for delivering these sorts is really quite complicated. You, know, you have to take them in, there's like 10 people ticking off the right boxes and things. It's a legal requirement that they give you this. It's part of the democratic process. I thought, I'll just you know, kick them out of the post office. But it's a lot more organized than that, I was quite surprised. Um, anyway, had a few left over to hand out on the street, about 1,500. Nobody should have this many copies of their own face <laughs> sitting <laughs> in their office looking at them. Days on end, it's weird. <laughs> I don't like it. I've still got a load, actually. Um, I didn't get rid of them all. Leafleting the street was amazing. I spent two, three entire days just saying, hi, I'm standing for election for something new. Can I give you a leaflet? Hi, I'm standing for election for something new. Can I give you a leaflet? And what I found people would walk past through the first part, and actually a surprising number of people stopped when I got past the, hi, I'm standing for election four, they'd be carrying on, and I said something new, and people would go, what's that? I'll take a little look. The name really gets into people's heads, it's quite nice. And um, you've learned to recognize patterns about leafleting. Generally, I had a little rule that the bigger the sunglasses, the less likely people were to take them. And um, there are a few others as well. Um, I haven't written those up in a blog post yet, maybe I will never do that. Um, <laughs> and people start walking past you and saying, oh, I saw you at the hospital the other night, you were very convincing. Really? You talked to the right person? That's a bit weird. Um, and people would, we had a hustings at school, and many of the school kids would come down and pass where I was And, um, you know, sort of shout out, oh, I'm going to vote for you. Somebody shouting, they're going to vote for me across the street. What the hell is going on in my life? Um, and you end up in the paper, and, you know, with all the other candidates, and there's a little bio about you and what you stand for. It's just weird, weird things start happening close to the election. People start putting posters in their houses for you. It's not that we have to make that poster because somebody emailed us saying, have got a poster, have you got a poster? And just, Jesus Christ, people want a poster. <laughs> <laughs> have not even thought of that. I never thought I was going to get in anyone. And then occasionally somebody sends you one of these, which is an X in a box next to a thing with your name. Like, what? Talking about similar things, we did, we were up here. We were the best 
beyond uh, somebody who's a very prominent local councillor and Wells Cave, who's been standing in Manchester for the Pirate Party for ever. Um, so I was really, really pleased with that, and I think it, we did that basically with very little manpower, very little money, and I think there's something in the power of the name that worked, the way we presented it worked. Um, so yeah, we spent about two grand. Um, the official spending, things are quite fun, they make it look like I made 400 pounds profit, whereas in fact, I didn't. Um, because there's a whole bunch of things you don't include, like all the fees for crowdfunding, the Electric Commission just don't understand what to do with that, even though they really could work this out a year ago. But if I phoned them up afterwards, and said, how do you want me to report this? And I'm like, oh, uh, I'll just go talk to the supervisor. But I know, the hundred candidates do crowdfunding. Surely you have an answer for this. But anyway. anyway, so what next? That's kind of the election that I've never had a rest. And what next? This is what next. All those small candidates, all those small parties, all the people thinking about the future of democracy, about how we do this better, we need to join up. We need to build a wider movement something that can be a sort of networked, progressive, 21st century choice. Um, and this is what we need to try and do. I don't honestly care who runs it. I don't care what it's called. All I care is that it exists, and it exists in a form that can make a difference. And if I can help with that, then that's awesome. Because what we have at the moment is we have the politics of this. We have the politics of the Industrial Revolution still hanging around now in the 21st century. And this, is a fundamentally different way of thinking than this. What's the democracy of this space going to look like? I believe fundamentally democracy is going to change over the next 30, 40 years. Who's going to do it? It's a slow change, it's generational. I did not get into this thinking I'm going to win this time and then I can, you know, have a job and whatever. This is going to be generational. I will still be fighting this fight in 30 years. But sometimes it's quicker. I don't want to have a mayor in Barcelona. It can happen quicker, but you can't guarantee it. But I really believe that there's a change coming. We have centralised politics, maybe a bit of distributed, uh, decentralised, sorry. But what is the politics in the end of the What is that truly distributed politics? What is the politics and the democracy of the network age? How do we work together? How do we think as a society? That is coming. Democracy will evolve, and it's starting to happen across the world. There's a fundamentally new way of thinking emerging. We see it in open source, open data, open everything. And open politics is just another aspect of that. And um, I want to make that happen. And if you want to too, then please join me, because we need help.